Hi, I'm Julien Blanchet, and I work in security and privacy at Google. I have the pleasure to be your host for this Atmosphere Digital, focusing on rethinking security in the cloud. Our goal today is to help you understand how Google protects your data. We think this is important. We also know that your time is important. So we have made sure that you get as much information as possible in less than an hour. You will hear some of our most respected security leaders share their insights and vision for the future of security online, on the web or at Google. We have invited some of our renowned customers who handle some of the most sensitive information to come and explain why they chose Google for their security. We've asked our engineers to show you hands-on what you should do to make the best of the security features Google can offer. Last but not least, we will share recent research showing that higher trust in innovative technology like the cloud translates into higher business benefits. This is the reason why it is useful for you to have this better understanding of security in the cloud. But first, I want to show you something quite special, something that even at Google, very few of us get to see. I want to take you to one of our Google data centers in the Dallas, Oregon, so you can witness firsthand the security, the reliability, the sustainability of Google's infrastructure on which we handle your data. My name is Sandeep, a developer advocate on the Google Cloud platform. Welcome to the Google Data Center at the Dalles, Oregon. Most Google employees can't even get in here. Let's go on a special behind the scenes tour. Noah, can you tell us a little bit more about the SRE role at Google? Yeah, SREs write and maintain the software systems designed to keep our services running. So what happens if one of these systems goes down? We've designed our systems from the ground up to be able to handle any unexpected failures that might occur. We have highly redundant power, networking, and serving domains, so that even if we do lose an entire cluster, we're able to redirect those workloads and live migrate data in order to minimize any impact. In addition, we have a team of SREs on call 24-7 that can tackle any problems that might arise. Let's take a deeper look at the data center infrastructure itself. Before we can continue further, we need to go through the biometric iris scan and circle lock. These only allow one person in at a time and require dual authentication to continue further. As you can tell, we have a lot of servers, and this is a single cluster in a single floor in a single building. Managing all of these servers on a global scale is quite a challenge. To utilize our fleet, we use tools such as Borg, Colossus, and Spanner. You may be familiar with similar tools such as Kubernetes, Google Cloud Storage, and BigQuery. Now, these tools allow Google engineers and cloud customers to more easily manage infrastructure, allowing everyone to build innovative and scalable applications. Here at Google, a lot of our infrastructure is custom made. This gives us the flexibility and performance we need to run all of our services at scale. So how efficient is our data center? Well, Google has some of the most efficient data centers in the world. In fact, when we started reporting our power usage effectiveness, or our PUE, in 2008, most other data centers were around 100% overhead. At that point in time, Google was 20% overhead, but since then, we reduced it to just 12%. So this is the Google-owned power substation. This is where the high voltage power enters the site, it's reduced, and then sent to multiple power distribution centers, such as this one right here. What happens if a power distribution center loses power? If it loses power, we have multiple generator and utility backup sources available to maintain power to those servers. And where does all the power come from? It actually comes from multiple hydroelectric power plants that are nearby. I love how Google uses reliable green energy whenever possible. You know, it seems like Google builds reliability from the ground up, from the power and cooling, all the way to the software systems that manage our fleet. Thanks for showing me around, Brian. So, what did you think? I think only superlatives apply to describe these data centers. And the level of physical security in place to protect your information is unmatched. Now, we are going to hear from Flint Waters, the Chief Information Officer for the State of Wyoming, where he provides the strategic leadership and technology direction for the state and is responsible for oversight and management of enterprise technology initiatives. Mr. Waters is going to walk you through how he trusts Google to stay secure. 
I'm Flint Waters. I'm the Chief Information Officer for the state of Wyoming. We're entrusted to, to watch over citizen information, right? So the government collects a lot of critical data for programs that citizens are involved in. It's, it's really important that we're watching over that material, protecting it, and also watching the privacy of our citizens. That's why we decided to be the first state to move to Google Unlimited. We wanted that, we wanted that release the day it came out. Um, we really wanted the cutting edge tools, the advanced auditing tools, um, the two-step authentication we could do by org, uh, the increased vault uh, security. There were a bunch of features that, that moving to unlimited was a no-brainer for a government sector. Moving to unlimited gave us that unlimited storage, gave us that ability to get out of our legacy file engagement. We no longer had data sitting on workgroup servers that were not necessarily protected by the security team at the state. And so that gave us an opportunity to, to move information to Google's cloud. That let us do what we do best, which is take care of citizens, and they do what they do best, which is protect data, to let us be in line to get the best tools as soon as they come out, and to break that traditional culture where data was sitting in unsafe states. So the loss prevention component definitely provides Wyoming with uh, its data at rest and, and data in transit. Second to that, Google's two-step verification uh, has, has become also invaluable in that we're able to protect sensitive accounts and information uh, from many, many types of phishing attempts. Vault's been huge for us. Uh, that was probably one of the biggest changes uh, as we move through the progression into the new account because it makes sure that we have secure copies of everything. We are an open record state, so citizens can request information and even in the cases where you know, a, an employee that has gone off the reservation and is trying to hide content, we can go back and recover those documents. It improves the transparency back to the citizens and it lets us respond very, very quickly. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Chromebooks because by rolling out the Chromebooks, we put out devices where malware cannot get a beachhead to get inside our network and do damage. If we had a disaster in our primary building and had to move, and we had a, a DR issue, I can engage directly against all the cloud content. It is secure wherever it sits. I can get to it from any device, anywhere, at any time. And by taking thousands of users off of that list of who penetrates your network, sometimes from home devices where you have no control of how they maintain them, you so dramatically reduce the approach, the attack vector, so that they can't get inside and start compromising our databases and our solutions. So the MDM solutions that Google offers uh, are just awesome. We have uh, uh, rolled that out to the enterprise uh, over Android. We have uh, just tested and rolled out the iOS component to some of our larger agencies with the goal of then uh, rolling that out as well to the enterprise. And that, that, that'll cover uh, the gist of many of our company's cell phone users. The best advice I would give uh, surrounding security would definitely be to work to impact your culture, changing the way you operate from a cultural perspective, and I think the rest kind of falls into place. The Google Cloud approach changed culturally how we think about doing business. Now they, they switch, they use mobile devices, they work on a single document, they get the real-time authoring on secure content. That whole cultural mindset to getting away from putting more copies of data out there than I can possibly protect, working on it where it sits secure at rest and I can get to it from anywhere. Engage your users to imagine their perfect workflow. If tech was no limit, what would their perfect approach be to solve a, con a specific problem? Then turn to the technology and challenge it to rise to meet your perception of the per perfect world. That's when cloud becomes a no-brainer. That's when engaging with Google makes perfect sense because they're a very agile company. They're rolling solutions out quickly and they're going to be closest to your perfect world scenario. Next, let's hear from a company that handles some of the most precious information that exists, money. Charles Schwab changed the world of trading and banking a decade ago, leading with technology. Today, we hear why they decided to improve their security by choosing Google's technology. There are multiple sides of Schwab's business, and one of those sides is the, the advisor side or the institutional side. And obviously, we offer a lot of products and a lot of services to our institutional customers. I'm responsible for making sure that we deliver on behalf of what our clients need. As we were looking for solutions applicable to what we were trying to solve, that was on a Friday. On Monday morning, we had two of their top engineers engaged with my engineers here. Three and a half hours later, I get a knock on my door. And I'll never forget what they said to me. They said, we've solved it. Google offered a number of services and capabilities within their Chromebook platform that were incredibly attractive. 
One of them was the ability to remotely control the devices. We could force them onto a specific network, our network. If they fell off that network, they would be unusable. If someone stole them, we had the ability to remotely wipe them. I would say one of the unique features of the Chromebook has to do with their operating system. The device isn't burdened with a lot of legacy or with a large OS. Instead, you know, the experience is you open the Chromebook and 10 seconds later you're online. Because of the kiosk capability that the Chromebook had to offer, when one of our clients came in to open up a SIP account, it would start up a new session. And as soon as that Chromebook was closed, session gone, everything gets erased. The full rollout and development started with a number of weeks of user engagement. We would take the Chromebooks out to specific branches, test it out, and then from there it was making sure that the device could stand up and do exactly what we needed to do, but do it at scale. When you're working with a firm that's got hundreds of branches out there and you're gonna eventually deploy well over a thousand of these devices, the ability to control them from a central location is absolutely paramount. Really the Chromebook was the one that met our needs. They work at any time, all the time. The security concerns that Charles Schwab is facing are the same concerns that a lot of businesses are dealing with today, including Google. When customers use Google's product, they get the same level of security that we have developed for ourselves, but right out of the box. And for companies like Charles Schwab, who handles so many people's life savings, security cannot be an afterthought. So, what is more personal and sensitive than life savings? Have a guess. What about your tax returns? Now, we hear from Scott Pemberthy of PricewaterhouseCoopers, a company whose core business is to handle some of the most sensitive information that exists. And let's find out how Google has helped them move the needle in security. Well, hi, I'm Scott Pemberthy. I'm the as our CEO says, the resident future of PwC. And my job is to help push our CIOs and our teams around the globe on how to adopt technology and really separate ourselves from competition and help our clients do the same. So security is absolutely an important factor pretty much in every decision we make at PricewaterhouseCoopers. It was a table stake. We assume that any partner we have has to meet our security standards of those and those of our clients. The main reason we chose Google is not only did you meet the table stake, you far exceeded them. And in addition, you're helping us drive innovation across the firm. First and foremost, we need to protect our clients' data and that of the firm and of our, our clients' customers where appropriate. At the same time, however, security needs to serve the company and needs to serve our clients and has to enable our clients to be agile and responsive to the market. We're conducting business globally and everyone is constantly under attack. What we have is this very innovative solution where we can actually take the log files that you would typically put in, into you know, a zip file and just leave them around and maybe later go into them, something should happen. We can take those log files, which is a tremendous amount of data, and it's just gonna get more intense, and we need to absorb that into a cloud. So we absorb that into Google Cloud. And then once you have potentially terabytes of data, of just log data, we then use Google Query to look on top of that and using some of our insights from our security professionals to look at patterns and identify patterns that can help our clients basically see things before they become a problem. What really keeps us secure is the way that you store data. If you're like most clients, it's just an Excel file or a Word file in a folder, in a safe, and we're really secure because it's like in our data center we know where it is. That's like stuffing it in your mattress today. What Google does is the first thing they do is they index that document so it's easy to search. But that index actually shows you where the content is. And what the first thing Google does is they separate the index from the raw data, which means the raw data by itself is meaningless. Then Google has what they call algorithmic encryption. It's like a child with a crayon. You scribble all over it. You don't know what it is. Step three, they rip that document into small pieces and they do that in triplicate. Then they scatter those pieces to the far corners of the earth. So any data center looks like a jumble of pieces of raw data that's encrypted that no one had, can make any sense of. And the way you retrieve data is when you ask for the data, regardless of where you're on the planet, Google pulls the data together in real time, and if two out of three agree, that's the one packet. That ability to put things together and have instant conversations with your team, no matter where you are on what device, and to do things in parallel by editing in the cloud, that's the hot seller across the firm, is using Hangouts to deliver the same security for our clients in a much more agile way. That was key to us actually adopting Google and using that across the globe. Let's meet Aaron Feigenbaum to speak with some of the Googlers that have helped build that infrastructure and are now helping to keep it secure. Welcome to Atmosphere Digital, Rethinking Security in the Cloud. We have this great panel here of experts through all across Google to talk about security. 
Information security has become such a hot topic with the uh, increase in cybercrime, the trends in privacy, the changes in regulations. It's something that businesses can't ignore. Enterprises all over the world are concerned about security. And to have a great conversation about information security, we brought in four different experts from all across Google, each a subject matter expert in security in their own specific domain. To my far left here, I have Tim Willis from our Chrome security team. Next up is Adrian Ludwig. Adrian is responsible for Android security. To my far right is Stefan Samoji. Stefan is a product manager in our security and privacy engineering team. To my immediate right is Suzanne Fry. She's the director of security, privacy, and trust. The move of businesses to cloud computing has really increased. The companies see the benefits of lower cost, but also the ability to innovate faster for users to collaborate. But one of the big areas of hesitation is security, right? Companies are not comfortable putting their own data uh, into the cloud. How would you respond to somebody that had that concern? I think we're seeing a real sea change right now with respect to people understanding that the cloud is more secure than on any on-premise solution. If you just think about it, mathematically, you've got all these different on-premise solutions and individual teams trying to do the right thing. And with any cloud provider, you have the locus of the best talent, the best expertise centered on making your solution secure and your data secure. If you take a look at our customer base, we have some of the world's largest banks. We have some of the most stringent government customers. We're FedRAMP certified here in the US. And the fact that we can solve for security for all of those customers is a great testimony to our capabilities. But in addition, we solve for something special. In talking to our customers, it's our ability to innovate and to bring new ideas to bear that help enable them to be competitive, productive, and truly novel and focus on the things that matter to them. That's part of our really special secret sauce, right? And I often say to people at Google, security comes in two forms. It's both traditional cybersecurity, but it's also security against technological stagnation. That's interesting because we don't usually think of that second one no. very often. We tend to think of the data security. That, that's great from a cloud perspective. How does that change in, in the Android or mobile world? Actually, I like the observation about being too focused on security to the exclusion of innovation. Um, it's I hadn't seen that phrase yeah. that way. Um, but I think one of the changes that we've seen in the mobile space over the last few years is um, companies have focused first and foremost on innovation, uh, Android being a, a great example of that. Um, but we've tied it to a security model that is how people actually consume applications and services, yeah. right? So um, we thought about you know, the web and the sandboxing model that was used on the web, and we incorporated that in the way we built application sandboxing. Um, and I think a consequence of that is cloud services are becoming more and more important. Most applications that are built for Android, that are built for mobile, regardless of your sort of mobile platform, are really cloud-based. Um, so I think those two were tied together uh, because yeah. both of them were thinking about innovation first and foremost, and then the security sort of unlocked that innovation. So it seems like cloud is actually, a, and mobile is a reason for companies to move to those environments. Is there stuff that Google's doing that others really can't? I think it's important to think of the context in which we're talking in here. So we have a complex set of systems that we're dealing with today. They get more and more complex over time. Um, we also have adversaries with increasing levels of sophistication. So you've got that on one side, and on the other side we've got uh, IT managers having to defend their networks. The problem with defense is you need to defend everything incredibly well. Attackers only need to find one hole into your network. So I think that's where an advantage of moving to the cloud is that you have dedicated teams with robust experience. I mean, Stefan and I were talking about this earlier, that some of the people who I work with wrote my textbooks in university. And it's one of those things that, you know, I get to work with these experts and that's all they do. They focus on security. And that's one of the huge benefits, in my point of view, moving to the cloud. That's great. Well, we're protecting data while it's at Google, but we actually do a lot of stuff to make sure the data is safe when it's not at Google, right? Safe browsing would be a good example of something that we can do at very, very large scale where we actually believe that the right approach is make the entire internet safer. So we build systems that hunt around and find malware and find phishing and then we go and report this. And so an individual consumer can benefit from this because their web browser will let them know. 
in a cloud environment, enterprises can take advantage of this data as well and keep themselves protected. And we take this approach uh, through a number of different areas, certificate transparency being another example, where we're taking a look at the internet as a whole and finding ways to keep it safe at scale. So obviously in working with various experts, and, and you guys are all experts in your field, right? This encourages us to innovate and come up with lots of security innovation. Some of those really actually go beyond and change security and really move the needle from what users are, are used to. Maybe you can all give me one of those examples that uh, we've done. I'd like to talk a bit about security keys. Security keys have, are you going right. to? Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, yeah, my collection with me. Oh, you have nice. multicolored nice. ones. Almost Google colors. <laughs> you need a green one. Uh, yeah. These keys are fabulous. Um, you know, for the longest time, you know, we have been talking about sort of two-factor authentication is, is critically important for most organizations to implement. And many you know, customers use, you know, Google Authenticator and other apps like that to generate a one-time passcode. And those are great. They're certainly better than nothing, right? However, a hardware-based security key such as these is just quantum leaps ahead in terms of, you know, they're not hackable um, and they really do protect our customers from phishing in a way that, you know, um, basically the, the one-time passwords do not, so. I think that's an interesting point, Suzanne, especially talking about, you know, the not so glamorous side of the things that we do. Um, one of those things is encryption for me. Like, it may not seem incredibly innovative, but we're working really hard to make sure that all of our traffic is encrypted at rest and at transit. And one example where we're being open with that is our HTTPS transparency report. Now you can go to that site and you can see our progress towards our goal of 100% encryption in transit through all of our products. Um, again, uh, another example would be working with TLS 1.3. That's the next generation of transport layer security. Now it may not sound glamorous, but we're not only helping to implement that, we're helping author the next version. So that shows that we're in the mix and we kind of know what technologies are around the corner. Uh, a practical application of that would be progressive web apps. So these are low friction web applications which are designed to help increase engagement and have an app-like experience for customers and businesses. Uh, we've seen studies how that increases engagement and it's fantastic, it's easy across the board. Why am I talking about it? Well, TLS is actually a hard requirement for those apps. So it's one of these things where not only are we innovating, we're making sure that security is baked in from the get-go, and I think that's one huge advantage of Google. There's a couple elements about that that are interesting to me. One of them is, it's not so much that the security itself is innovative, it's about using an innovative product to make security available. Um, one of the things that we did early on with Android is, we thought about the platform stack, we're like, okay, you need to have verified boot, and you need to have encryption, and you need to have sandboxing. Those are all sort of, I think at this point, almost commodities for an operating system. Um, but one of the things that Google brought to bear was security services, right? It's going to be a cloud-connected device, and we're going to make all of those services available by default on all of the devices. And so we started thinking about how do you bind services into the operating system itself. Um, so we added things like safety net and verify apps where there are effectively hooks in the operating system um, where we can make sure that we're adding security sort of dynamically over time. And so we can innovate in security even more quickly than we can innovate in the operating system itself. Um, does anybody know that that's happening? Not really, yeah. um, but that's okay because yeah. they're safer and they're happier as a, as a result of it. So uh, we sort of, the same way that you guys are doing with TLS and um, progressive web apps, binding those two things together just kind of transparently and in the background. I'm going to two ends of that spectrum. There's also transparency. I mean, Tim, you were already talking about the HTTPS transparency report, but we've been doing transparency and we've been shining light on ourselves for many, many years. Uh, a couple of years back, we did the Safer Email Transparency Report where we were looking, but first of all, is there anything that we're doing that we could do better? And then having looked at that, what is the rest of the world doing? And it's actually moved the needle forward. We are now in a position to say, yes, as a result, of shining the light and illuminating the greater situation on the internet, more people are using encryption for their email. Uh, it happens across all of our transparency reports where first we look at ourselves to see if we're doing the best job that we possibly can, and very often then we cast our gaze more widely into the outside world to see what else is out there and if we can help people improve things. Yeah, transparency is actually a really big part of moving to the cloud. I mean, especially we see that a lot with our enterprise customers, right? I mean, absolutely. If you think about it, like anything, if you don't know enough or have sufficient information, how in the world can you make a decision, right? And how can you how can you run your business? And I do think that transparency has been one of the biggest blockers to adoption across all cloud products. We've been investing in multiple areas to ensure that transparency is is front and center to what we do. Uh, we 
engage third party auditors, right, to help ensure and, and provide certifications against certain standards like ISO 27017 and 18. Our FedRAMP process is also um, disclosed to the government and, and leveraged you know, uniquely in terms of making sure that across our company we are aware of vulnerabilities and, and addressing them quickly. And I think just in general providing information to the end user about whether or not you know, their employees have had a password violation or have had some suspicious activity or giving them greater reporting detail. And I, you know, I'm the first to say that we still have some work to do on the reporting front. And I think every cloud provider does, but we're working really hard to improve the degree that you know, an administrator understands everything that's happening within their company and can take appropriate action. So a lot of what you guys all talked about, whether it's transparency for our enterprise customers or for all users or some of the innovation in Android, we really wouldn't have expected years ago. Uh, I at least wouldn't have predicted that. You guys are all experts and very deep in your field. What would be your security vision? What's going to change? What's going to make our lives easier for our users? I think a lot of the security, as we've talked about before, needs to stay invisible. And in some cases, it's going to be a little bit counterintuitive. So a couple of months back, we released a product called OnHub, which is a home networking router. And one of the things that's particularly counterintuitive about it, but which is adding a lot more security, is the fact that it's cloud managed. So all the technology that we devise to protect our users' accounts, like Suzanne was talking about with the security key, all of that benefits the user because the Google account is the way the user starts to manage their device at home. So as we connect all the various pieces of our security puzzle, they all work together, and suddenly you have a device at home which is actually cloud managed and cloud secured, which is not the way it was even a few years ago. There's a distinct security benefit now. I'd like to talk a little bit about the elephant in the room with respect to security, which is this dynamic tension between access to data and keeping it secure. Right? Um, one of the very hard things for most enterprises is to say, listen, someone else is going to be the governor of our data, um, or steward of our data, perhaps I should say. And what is that company going to do with our data? And I reference you know, audit reports and certifications that we commit to every year. However, um, machine learning is one of the most exciting things that's happening in the field of computer science today. And machine learning requires training data to perform. Um, and obviously, with customers sharing data with us, we could just take that data and go nuts, <laughs> you know, which would be irresponsible of Google and you know, would really kill our vision overall. But I do think solving that problem and putting our customers in control of what data we can use uh, to enhance the way that they work, to improve productivity, to reduce the costs, and to understand how competitive they are in a global landscape for a given industry. That's super exciting stuff. So I think finding you know, that gentle balance between making sure that customers can maintain absolute control over who sees their data, when, and uses it for what, it's one of the most exciting problems we have to solve because it's going to bring tremendous advances to mankind. Wow, that's impressive. I feel like I'm the guy who's going to talk about the boring thing. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's really exciting that more and more companies are moving, like I think, more deeply into the cloud. I mean, for some background, like before I joined Google, I was a sysadmin and an IT manager until I caught the security bug, pun intended, and ended up uh, joining an incident response team. So a lot of what I was doing was rolling out to companies and departments who had been hacked and helping them clean up their networks, helping them you know, rebuild up their defenses, and kicking the miscreants out. And it's one of these things where, as we mentioned earlier, it's just going to get more and more sophisticated and it's harder that moving to the cloud actually buys you the Google security team in a sense. Like It gives you the protection that we're offering. It lets you not have to worry about that. Uh, and one of the great advantages of that is as an IT manager, you know, I don't have to worry about that. I can, I can sleep a little bit better at night knowing that you know, Google's got my back when it comes to security. Yeah, I mean, I think it's been interesting talking with folks and getting a little bit different perspective. I mean, even in the last minute or two, um, we've heard um, discussion about sort of hardware security, and we've talked about machine learning and pulling in data from different places. Um, Google, every conversation you learn a little bit something new. And I think that's one of the key things that the security industry is going through right now. Um, we're beginning to a point where there's enough maturation in all of our products, where there's enough data that's being pulled in, enough ability to analyze that data, where we can actually start to make good decisions. Right? For generations, really, from a technology standpoint, we've been relying on assumptions about what good security looked like, you know, which things you need to be worried about, what risk is likely to hit you. But now that people are moving into the cloud, now that we have 
operating systems like Android, where we're trying to deploy security solutions across the entire ecosystem, we get a lot of data. And we can analyze that, and we can start to make really good decisions. So I think that's uh, the thing that I'm most excited about over the next few years, is we're going to get to the point where, as professionals, we can actually understand risk and make really good risk-based uh, decisions, um, which isn't something we've been able to do in the past. Uh, it's not something that's possible if you're not in the cloud, if you're not on mobile. Um, so that's what I'm really excited about. The one thing that's really in common with everything everybody said is having a large security team that's capable and has the expertise to really ingest all that, to be able to do the things for you on the cloud or to use all that data that now we have to make products more and more secure or to develop that uh, machine learning. So hopefully this was a, a good insight for everybody to, uh, to hear what some of our security leaders at Google are thinking about, uh, what they're working on and uh, what they're working on in the future. So thank everybody for, uh, for taking the time and listening in to us. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you to me. Thank you. Picking up on Suzanne's point about the security key, take note of this. If you're a Google customer, you can benefit from a 50% discount on these keys. Make sure that you visit the link that we share with you. Sign in with your Google account and order keys for your users. They are easy to deploy and they are easy to manage. After all, you have a key for your car, you have a key for home. Now you can have a key for your data. If you're not a Google customer, think about this. Last year, theft and abuse of login credentials was the cause of three quarters of the data breaches. A recent analysis at the University of California, San Diego, has shown that a well-designed phishing page has 43% chance to be successful. That means that two, three mails sent to your employees have a 100% probability to grant access to your network. There is no reason to run that risk anymore. The technology exists. If you use it, we can build a safer web. We were curious to figure out how do companies that trust new technology fare compared to their peers that do not trust newer technology? Let's listen to our special guest, Carolyn Whelan from the Economist Intelligence Unit, to tell us about their research on the business impact of trust in technology. Hi everyone, I'm Carolyn Whelan of the Economist Intelligence Unit. Welcome to our look at the business impact of trust in cloud technology. This overview is based on a global survey we conducted on the topic. First, let's put this in context. The cloud is everywhere today. About 58% of companies have at least some of their data in the cloud, according to IDC. So like all new technologies, the cloud impacts much of a company's operations. But logically, the impact of new technologies over time are linked to trust. Users need to feel safe and secure about issues, including reliability and access for a transformation in work or life practices. And the broader economic benefits from such innovations, such as cost and efficiency gains, often trail this all-in approach. To explore any links between trust in cloud technology and its tangible and intangible benefits, the Economist Intelligence Unit in April polled almost 500 executives in 10 countries on their use of and trust in cloud technology. We then separately asked them how their organizations fare compared to their peers on a number of performance metrics ranging from profit to sector leadership. Through these questions, the study assesses connections between cloud use, cloud trust, and organizational performance. So here's what we found. Use of the cloud is widespread, it's growing, and it's transforming a broad range of activities. In fact, roughly 72% of respondents report that cloud use has actually transformed their information technology. So does trust in the cloud matter? Seems so. High trust in the cloud correlates with numerous positive business outcomes, most notably higher profits. There's a clear and statistically significant link between both overall trust levels and changes in revenue, profitability, and share price. As you'll see in this chart, a much larger portion of those who say their organizations have very or somewhat high trust in the cloud cite 
higher performance in a number of areas compared to their peers who cite lower trust levels. Some areas that stand out include financial performance, agility, and ability to innovate. Similarly, a significantly larger portion of those who report very or somewhat high levels of cloud trust note higher transformation in many areas than their peers who cite lower trust levels. Areas they say have been transformed by the cloud range from business models to collaboration. Surprisingly, correlations in our data between cloud use alone and the business benefits of the cloud are weak or not statistically significant. This suggests that the transformative nature of the cloud on an organization's operations hinges in part on widespread embrace of the cloud rather than its use alone. In other words, it's not enough to buy something or install something, you have to trust it. This brings us to the importance of championing cloud trust rather than just rolling it out. Many more respondents who say their organizations have high cloud trust also say leadership backs cloud use and that cloud use is a competitive advantage. Similarly, 61% of respondents who cite overall very high cloud trust levels also say that senior leadership makes cloud trust a top priority. Meanwhile, only 16% of those with lower trust levels note senior leadership commitment to the cloud. Also, 62% of respondents who say their organization has a very high level of cloud trust overall say that the degree of trust in the cloud is a competitive advantage versus 45% of other respondents. But there's still work ahead because though cloud use is growing, trust in its use is slowing. Levels of trust in cloud technology have grown markedly but still lag the extent of its use. Notably, 60% of respondents think that current levels of trust are below the level they believe cloud technology merits. So in conclusion, how to tie the research to real life. Our key takeaways are, as organizations expand their use of the cloud, those with higher levels of trust, first, are able to transform their organizations more quickly. Second, the resulting business benefits are substantial. And thirdly, active efforts to increase trust are important to raising trust levels. In sum, this suggests an all-in commitment to cloud is critical to reap its full business benefits. Particularly interesting when you dig deeper in these results was that it is not so much whether you have the cloud or not, that makes a difference. But the data shows that it is when you really trust the cloud and use its real capabilities that you reap the business benefits. We kept the best for the end, of course. When you use Google's technology, you benefit from the whole of Google's security that we have built for ourselves. We have said this before. But not all the features are activated by default. So we've asked Andriel Rotzler who regularly deploys Google's technology with our largest customers to show us what you should do to maximize security and privacy for your Google domain. For example, what should you do to opt in to our European model contract clauses and our data processing amendment and operate in peace of mind in Europe? What should you do to activate anti-spoofing technology? and make sure that your email accounts cannot be hijacked to attack other accounts. I'll give you a hint. Most of the time, it's a simple click or two. Hi, my name's Andrea Rotzler, and I'm a part of Google's security outreach team. I work with many of our enterprise customers to deploy Google technology. Google was born in the cloud, and we've built our security from the ground up to mitigate the unique threats for cloud systems. We've built this for ourselves, but now we make this available to businesses, schools, and government institutions around the world. Our cloud services are designed to deliver better security than many traditional on-premise solutions. And I'm now going to show you a few of Google's important security features that are available to you today. Most people still only have a single layer of security to protect their account, their password. Today, two-step verification is seen by many as the necessary additional layer of security. Let's walk through a few of the steps to how you would activate two-step verification and set up a security key. In the admin console, 
click on the security sections. From there, go to basic settings, then select two-step verification. Use the checkbox to allow users to opt in. But if you'd like to enforce enrollment for your domain, go to advanced settings. From here, you have the option to select a future enrollment date. This will allow for enrollment of end users and training. As you saw earlier in the security roundtable, we recommend security keys, which is a small key that you use to insert into your computer and tap on. This sends an encrypted code to Google servers without you having to type anything on the screen, and it's quick, simple, and more secure. Would you enter your email address and password on this page? This looks like a very standard login page, but it's not. It's what we call a phishing page, a site run by people looking to steal your password. In addition to two-step verification, to help keep your account safe, we offer Password Alert. It's a free, open-source Chrome extension that protects your Google accounts. Once installed, Password Alert will show a warning if you type in your Google password into a site that isn't a Google sign-in page or other approved sites. Millions of businesses rely on Google to be smart about how we protect employee logins to services, like Google Drive and Gmail. We're making it easier to use that smart account security by giving employees secure single sign-on access to a wider set of SaaS and custom-built apps on desktop and mobile devices. We have enhanced our OpenID Connect, OIDC, identity provider support that can already be used with many SaaS apps and adding support for security assertion markup language, SAML 2.0, for more than 15 popular SaaS providers. We're also making it easy for admins to add new custom SAML 2.0 app integrations. Our customers are using Google Identity Services to make it easier for their employees to sign in, but more importantly, leveraging our state-of-the-art security with other SaaS providers. Every company has data it must keep secure. Data Loss Prevention, DLP for Gmail, will add another layer of protection to prevent sensitive information from being revealed to those who shouldn't have it. Organizations may have a policy that the sales department shouldn't share customer credit card information with vendors. And to keep that information safe, admins can easily set up a DLP policy by selecting credit card numbers from a library of predefined content detectors. The Gmail DLP will automatically check outgoing emails from the sales department and take action based on what the admin has specified. Either quarantine the email for review, modify the message, or block the email from being sent and notify the sender. In addition to spam being generally annoying and wasting of your time, phishing emails can cause significant security issues. Sender Policy Framework, SPF, is a simple mechanism designed to help prevent email spoofing. Domain Keys Identified Mail, DKIM, is another form of protection that helps to cryptographically authenticate email. Domain-based message authentication, DMARC, provides an additional layer of email authentication. By utilizing DKIM or SPF and ensuring the display name your user sees is aligned with the actual sender to prevent email spoofing. DMARC also provides important reports for you to understand how your domain is being used and possibly spoofed, which can be helpful information to protect your brand from abuse. SPF and DMARC are largely accomplished through DNS settings. Google's Identity Service provides even more security on mobile when combined with Google Enterprise Mobile Management, EMM controls like password strength, screen lock requirements, and apps management. Beyond mobile, one of the areas that customers have challenges is with managing shared computers. Whether it's a break room computer for their employees or a kiosk for customers to use, with Chrome OS devices you can configure these machines in kiosk mode such that the data is wiped between users and the system even reboots from a verified image in less than 10 seconds. I know that's a lot of information about security, but let's recap the four areas we covered. First, strong authentication. 2SV, security keys, and password alert. Second, cloud-based identity management. Third, data protection, DLP and Gmail. And fourth, device management. In summary, we make security a priority to protect our own operations. But because Google runs on the same infrastructure that we make available to our customers, your organization can directly benefit from these protections. No one does more to keep you and your information safe and secure and put you in control. Hello, my name is James Snow. Today I'm going to be giving you an update on the legal compliance and specifically focusing on European legal compliance for our platform. 
The first thing I'd like to discuss before I go into all the specifics is the first mis misconception that's associated with our product. So there's often confusion between what we offer in our consumer space versus what we make available to businesses, schools, and governments. So it is very true that in the consumer space, Google is the data controller, i.e. users consent to give us their information and we use that for advertising. That's a very well-known fact. Now, what is lesser known or what I'd like to share with you today is that when we talk about data usage for businesses, for schools, for governments, for nonprofits, it's completely the opposite. In these scenarios, you are the data controller and Google is merely the data processor. And what that means is that Google can only use your data to provide the service that you're requesting. So we can't use it for things like advertising, profiling. So let's start talking about data privacy. Now, data privacy really consists of three major areas. We need to tell you what we're doing with your data. We need to legally commit to what we do with your data. And then last but not least, how do you really know what we're doing with your data? And I'm going to cover all three of those topics in depth now. So the first part, telling you what we do with your data. This involves transparency. So at Google, we pride ourselves on making all the information that you would need to make a informed decision available to you in advance before you become a customer. Our terms of service available online, our privacy policy, our sub-processors, our data center locations, our security certifications, and our product uptime are all publicly available without you requiring an NDA or becoming a customer. Now, the important thing to understand here is the scope of processing. What can we use your data for? It's very simple. We can only use your data to provide the service that you've requested. That's it, nothing else. For intellectual property of data, also very simple. You maintain all rights to all intellectual property for the data, and Google remains, we have the intellectual pri uh, property rights for the service. So, very, very happy. Last but not least is portability of data. So if you decide to move all of your data onto Google this weekend, which we'd, we'd be happy to help, but next weekend you decide you'd like to move off of our platform, all the data is 100% portable. So it comes off either in the format you've uploaded or it can be converted to an industry standard format so you can take it to whichever platform you prefer. Now, that's where explain what we do with your data. Now, also very important is what can we commit to legally within a contract? So, the contracts at Google consist of three major components. Our terms of service, which is our contract. Our data processing amendment, which is our, privacy, our global data privacy policy for our, our enterprise customers. And last but not least, European standard contractual clauses, which are required for, uh, for authorizing data transfers outside of the EEA. Now, all of our contracts and our, our data processing amendment are all written in the language of the European Data Protection Directive i.e., you are the data controller and Google is the data processor. Now, a brief history on European data protection. So this is often important to understand because many customers or folks, they remember different portions of each law. So I want to explain what the law is and then how we comply. So firstly, when most people think about European data protection, they're referring to the EU Data Protection Directive, which was passed in 1995. The EU Data Protection Directive had specific uh, requirements around restrictions on what personal data could be used for and very importantly where that data could be stored. So when many Europeans remember that all the data has to be stored within Europe, they're remembering this law from 1995. Now what's also important about the directive is how it was implemented. So effectively the form language was created in Brussels and then every member country had to pass their own version of the law. So you have a version in France, a version in the UK, a version in Ireland, and now these countries only had one data protection authority. If you go to a more complex jurisdiction like Germany, Germany has a DPA for every region in Germany. So Germany has 16 different DPAs. Now, this is in 1995 when the internet was young. If we move forward five years to the year 2000, this is when the Safe Harbor Treaty Framework was introduced. What the Safe Harbor Treaty Framework allowed, uh, allowed you to do was it allowed you to transfer data from Europe to the US while meeting the requirements under the EU Data Protection Directive, which is good, but not great. What was even better was what happened in 2010. This was the introduction of EU model contract clauses or standard contractual clauses. The big difference here was it allowed Europeans not just to export their data to the US, 
but allow them to export their data to nearly any jurisdiction in the world as long as the correct legal framework and data protections were in place. Now, this really was a big change. Now, model contract clauses required that the data protection authorities have jurisdiction, that sub-processors be disclosed, that, that certain security pr protections are written into the contract. So this was really, really a big deal. Now, when we start looking at current, uh, current themes, so just recently, the European Court of Justice struck down the Safe Harbor Treaty framework. Now remember, that was just between the US and the EU. Since then, the Article 29 Working Party in Brussels has reaffirmed that EU model contract clauses are still a valid and legal means of data transfer outside of EEA, which of course is to the United States and all of the world. Other pieces that are being talked about in upcoming legislation is the Privacy Shield. The Privacy Shield will be a replacement for the Safe Harbor Treaty Framework. However, that will also only be between the EU and the US, not as comprehensive as model contract clauses. Now, Brussels has been working hard since 1995 to actually replace the EU Data Protection Directive. The regulation would have one single set of rules that would apply to all of Europe. Once it has been accepted, please look to Google for an update on both the Privacy Shield and the GDPR going forward. So, that's it about contractual requirements. So the contractual requirements are the terms of service, the data processing amendment, and accepting EU model contract clauses to make those data transfers legal. But now down to the, almost the more important part. How can you really trust Google with your data? And the answer here is trust but verify. So we verify with independent third-party audits. So let's talk about them for a bit. Now, doing an audit at Google is hard. Now, our infrastructure is completely customized. Our data centers run on servers that we design, on operating systems that we've created, and the way in which we store and protect data is completely unique in the marketplace. So for us to perform an audit, we can't just send in someone with a clipboard and a checklist. We need to embed our auditors with our operations teams, for, uh, sometimes for over a year, for them to be able to first understand how our systems function and then be able to perform an audit against them. What the outcome is, is an extremely comprehensive audit from an independent third party. Now, audits traditionally been focused on security, and we, we have all the audits that you'd expect. ISO 27001, ISA 3402, SSA 16, SOC 2, SOC 3, and recently we've gotten FedRAMP, which is the security standard for doing business with the US government. Because Google operates one cloud, all of these certifications apply to all of our customers globally, which is a big differentiator. But all of those certifications are focused on security, and Google is a pretty secure company. Um, so customers accept that fairly quickly. It's about data privacy. What's Google doing with my data? This is ISO 27018. We announced that we are able to meet ISO 27018 earlier this year. Now, it's important to understand just how revolutionary this is. So when we talk about the ISO certifications, you need to understand how they work. So first, you have to have security. So that's ISO 27001-2, where you have over 114 controls focused on security, physical security, asset control, cryptography, et cetera. Now, ISO 27018 is built on top. This is focused on data privacy for a cumulative 143 controls. Now the independent analyst is looking and saying, well, I see that Gmail is secure, but what's happening to all that data? That's looking at things like data use, retention, access, all of this is done. So when we talk about certification under data privacy, it's actually much more complicated than security because you can get to data by a different number of means. So our ISO 27018 certification has to cover our core applications, our APIs, our SDKs, and some of the additional add-ons that we use in some of our products like Classroom for Education or Inbox for, for, for corporations. Uh, with that, I hope that it's a good summation of our legal and data privacy standards that we have at Google. This is an area that's constantly evolving. So with us, Google is working with, uh, with, with teams in Brussels, in Washington, and throughout the world to not just be compliant now, but also to be compliant in the future as, as the stage changes. Thank you very much, and speak to you soon. So we've come to the end of our time together. As you can hear at Google, we see a safer web within our reach and we are committed to making you part of it. We've gotten some terrific insights about some of the security concerns and seen the incredible work Googlers do to ensure your data is secure in the cloud. We've heard firsthand accounts from our customers 
and gotten some great analysis from experts at the Economist Intelligence Unit on the business benefit of trusting the cloud. If there is anything you've missed, remember, this video will also be available on our on-demand platform following the event. Also, we value your input. And we have a brief survey that you can take to tell us what you think about the event. So on behalf of the Google team, thank you for joining us. <laughs>